The South Carolina Hall of Fame was founded in Myrtle Beach in 1973 to recognize and honor contemporary and past citizens who have made outstanding contributions to South Carolina's heritage, history, and progress. Well, I believe that I've lived through a very exciting time in the history of our country. And I was in a position where I was involved in uh, a lot of dramatic events. William Childs Westmoreland was born in Spartanburg County, South Carolina, on March 26, 1914, to James Ripley Rip and Eugenia Childs Westmoreland. My grandfather had incredible standards, and I think my father uh, instinctively, and, and not in some kind of psychological, dramatic way, I think he just instinctively strove to meet those, uh, those standards and uh, met them and probably exceeded them. Growing up in Pacolet, South Carolina, William Westmoreland became an Eagle Scout by the age of 15. After graduating from Spartanburg High School in 1931, he attended the Citadel for a year before transferring to the West Point Military Academy. I think just as important as what he got out of West Point is what he brought to West Point. He was a very moral and ethical individual. Uh, he was very self-confident, self-reliant, a motivated person, uh, but he was also uh, modest as well. When he graduated from the Academy in 1936, upon graduation day, he was awarded the Pershing Sword, which is a, a high honor that's given to the cadet, not the cadet who is the, at the top of his class, but the one who demonstrates uh, excellence uh, in martial and military aspects of being an officer, and Westmoreland really embodied those traits. With the 9th Infantry in World War II, William Westmoreland saw combat in North Africa, Sicily, France, Belgium, and Germany, receiving several medals and honors for his bravery. He also began a lifelong friendship with future four-star general Melvin Zace. They, uh, they fought in Tunisia together. Uh, they parachuted into Sicily together. Uh, they both fought in southern France. And they both fought in the Battle of the Bulge. But they became really close when General Westmoreland was my father's boss at Fort Bragg uh, right after World War II. While at Fort Bragg, William Westmoreland married Catherine Kitsy Van Dusen and eventually had three children. Catherine Stevens, Stevie, James Ripley, Rip, and Margaret Childs. After World War II and Korea, uh, during peacetime, Westmoreland continued to excel. In 1956, he became the youngest Major General in the United States Army. In 1960, he became the Commandant of the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. This also was seen as a very prestigious post for somebody to hold. And that was three years. And uh, we often say that was the, uh, well, to say maybe the best three years of our, quote, family and our family life, because we were more or less a normal family. In 1963, President Johnson ordered General Westmoreland to Southeast Asia, and a year later was promoted to commanding general of the U.S. Military Assistance Command in Vietnam. Our objective in South Vietnam was to keep the North Vietnamese from taking over South Vietnam by force. Uh, the government of South Vietnam is, 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 is a non-communist government. U.S. national policy for the war when that was set by the President and by the Secretary of Defense, Secretary uh, Robert McNamara, was not for the United States to win the war. The strategy was to do enough military operations that would inflict enough pain on the enemy to persuade them to stop. But we weren't going to try to win. General Westmoreland commanded in Vietnam until 1968, directing an escalation of the Allied war effort while at the same time dealing with the growing anti-war protests back home. 
I think his strategy and his approach to the conflict were basically correct. Uh, he was not, uh, as is sometimes portrayed, as, as a, a fool or a somebody who is so stuck in a certain mindset that he can't somehow see alternatives to uh, conventional military operations or to understand guerrilla warfare and counterinsurgency. He understood those things. My, my father's attitude was one of, of duty and this is my job so he he had no just naturally took took upon the the face of the war if you will. Uh, he was a soldier he was doing his job and this was I don't even think it was a conscious thought for him. It was, this is what he did. In July of 1968, General Westmoreland became the 25th Chief of Staff of the United States Army in Washington, D.C., six months after the Viet Cong began their infamous Tet Offensive. To many, this created a misaligned perception. Yes, I think Westmoreland uh, was probably one of the most misunderstood and wrongfully maligned uh, general officers in American military history. Certainly there were probably people in Washington who were dissatisfied with how Westmoreland was prosecuting the war uh, and who would favor you know, his relief because of it. But there really is no particular evidence that President Johnson uh, or Secretary of Defense McNamara regarded his removal as punishment uh, for anything in particular. Um, and of course, what they did was to promote him to become chief of staff. So I think an interpretation that this was somehow a criticism uh, is, is misplaced. After retiring from active duty in 1972, General Westmoreland and his wife returned to South Carolina and in 1974 runs unsuccessfully for governor, losing to Senator James Edwards in the Republican primary. Well then after that, I think he probably had to figure out what he was going to do and, and what he uh, chose to do was to speak to veterans groups across the country and there were many, many of them. He spoke in all 50 states and there were people inviting him to speak all over the country. I think he just felt and there was such a huge need amongst the Vietnam veteran for someone to come and speak to them and look at them and say, you know, we did this together. He spoke to people and he was proud of what he did and he was proud of what they did. And I think there was a great hunger to hear that. And it didn't matter if the guy had hair down to here and tattoos all over his body. If, if he had served, my father embraced him. And um, so I think that became really his, his mission General Westmoreland was a uh, pallbearer at my father's funeral because he was one of my dad's closest friends. And uh, they'd served together uh, in, uh, in World War II, uh, at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and in Vietnam. And uh, so when you serve in war with somebody for a long period of time, you get to be pretty close. In, in his later life, as, as you may know, he had, he had Alzheimer's and uh, he, uh, he kind of took the world off his shoulders. The Alzheimer's uh, was, a, was, I guess I would say, mild and, and, and pleasant and he was very, he was a lot of fun and he was very sweet. I mean, that's kind of an odd word to use for my father. No one would ever call him sweet, uh, you know, in his, in his prime. But he was a, a, a lovely person and he was, uh, he was a lot of fun. General Westmoreland passed away on July 18, 2005 in Charleston, and his remains were interred at the West Point Cemetery. 
The Vietnam War continues to stir debates among scholars and the public alike, but family and friends remember the uncompromising values of the man behind the four stars. I, I think the people of South Carolina should be proud of General Westmoreland in a time of peril. Uh, he went to war uh, at enormous sacrifice to his own personal well-being and his family, uh, and he led American soldiers with integrity and valor for four years. And uh, I think people should be proud of this native son of our state. Well, I think Westmoreland should be remembered as the southern gentleman that he was, uh, as a courageous soldier who fought for his country in three major wars, as a person who was moral and uh, decent, who did not waver from his convictions, and who was dedicated to the country and to the army that he served. He was definitely, definitely a role model. I mean, again, this was a man who, who had great standards and lived up to them, you know, 100%. So uh, he, you know, he's certainly a role model. He loved the state, and I think he's a great example. Uh, obviously, a lot of people are going to be born here and, and stay here and raise their family here, but he was one of the ones that, that left and um, made a dent on the world and then then came home uh, happily so.